This is a teaching by Pastor Nico Simmons from ICU God Ministries Online. Pastor Nico has started a new series on the book of Amos. And now, here is Pastor Nico as he teaches through the book of Amos. The title of this message is Judgment on Israel's Neighbors. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we declare that you are a good God and we declare that you are a great King. Thank you that we can study your word today. It is my prayer that your Holy Spirit will open our minds so that we will understand what you want to say to us. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. How many times have you ever heard a sermon that you thought, Boy, I wish so and so was here. Or, I hope so and so is listening. One thing preachers love hearing is amens. So much so that some unfortunately fall into the trap of pulling out amen lines. What are amen lines, you ask, Pastor Nico? Well, a sure way to get amens is to preach against somebody else's sin, something that I do not have a problem with. If you want to get real loud amens, just preach in front of a ladies group about how their husbands are supposed to act. That will work every time. That is why Amos was getting such a willing audience. Now remember who Amos was. He had the deck stacked against him. He was a no-name, nobody from nowhere. And he was an outsider. He was from Judah and God called him to preach in Israel. So imagine how well he would have been received if he had come right in with guns blazing, preaching against them. They would have thrown him out even without listening to him. So what did he do? He started off preaching about other people's sin. As you look through the first and second chapters, we see Amos preaching against each of the nations that surrounded Israel. He started with those dirty, rotten Syrians. Their capital was Damascus, and they were situated northeast of Israel. Amen. God needs to judge Damascus. Then he moved to the Philistines in Gaza. They were southwest of Israel. Well, you know what a pain the Philistines have been. They have been causing problems since before Goliath. Amen. Burn them with fire, God. Yeah. Next was Tyre. Tyre was on the coast northwest of Israel. They were no good too. Right, Amos? God can get them too. Then Edom and Ammon and Moab, those nations formed a triangle off to Israel's southeast. Israel had had problems with each of them throughout their history. Amen, Amos. All of them are bad. Judge them, God. Damascus, Gaza, Tyre, Edom, Moab and Ammon. And that was six nations. Now, Hebrew literature is very dependent on numbers, and they viewed six as an incomplete number. So no preacher in his right mind would have had a sermon with six points. So Amos listeners knew one more was coming, and they knew it was going to be a big one. The seventh and last point was always the biggest. Hebrew tradition called for saving the best for last. So, who was Amos' seventh point? Judah, his home country and Israel's closest neighbor, the other half of the divided kingdom. Those people who thought they were so special because they had Jerusalem and the temple. 
now we know what God really thinks about them. He is going to judge them just like all the other nations around us. Amen. Good servant Amos. Boy, you really stepped on some toes there. You can almost hear the Bible pages flipping, can't you? Now at this stage, the people of Israel was done listening, but Amos was not done preaching. Oh, by the way, Israel, I am not quite finished yet. I have an eighth point. Chapter 2, in the first part of verse 6 says, Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Israel, and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof. Oh yeah, Israel, God is going to judge you too. I imagine you could have heard a pin drop. There were certainly no amens anymore. In this passage that runs from Amos chapter 1 verse 1 through to the end of chapter 2, the prophet is telling Israel about God's pattern of judgment. And God shows his pattern in how he pronounces judgment on the nations, on Judah, and finally on Israel. Times have changed and the names on the map have changed, but God remains the same. But not only does God remain the same, man's response to him remains the same. And because of those two things, God's judgment remains the same also. During the middle of the 8th century BC, a flurry of prophets were blasting out God's warnings to both the northern and the southern kingdoms. To the southern tribe of Judah, God sent Isaiah and Micah. To the northern ten tribes of Israel, He sent Hosea, Jonah, and the subject of the next in our minor prophet series, the prophet Amos. I like to call Amos the in-your-face prophet. He was hard-nosed. He was no-nonsense. He was a tell it like it is kind of guy, and he was God's trumpet in this book. Now Amos 1 verse 1 says, The words of Amos, who was among the herdsmen of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam the son of Joash king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. We are told that Amos wrote two years before an earthquake. This must have been quite an earthquake. It was so memorable, in fact, that the prophet Zechariah was still talking about it 250 years later. He makes reference to this earthquake in Zechariah 14 verse 5. You can look it up later. It is interesting that Josephus, the Jewish historian, also mentions this earthquake. He links it to the fake pride of King Uzziah. Do you recall about Uzziah? Rather than be content with being king, he wanted to expand his role. He also wanted to be priest. This, of course, was a violation of God's law. For God had ordained a separation of powers. Kings and priests were to be distinct. That is why in 2 Chronicles 26, we are told that when Uzziah entered the temple, God struck him with leprosy. Josephus adds that the earthquake occurred at the same time that Uzziah was struck by God's judgment. Let me read Josephus' account. He said, A great earthquake shook the ground, and a tear was made in the temple, and the bright rays of the sun shone through it, and fell upon the king's face, insomuch that the leprosy seized him immediately. Before the city, half the mountain broke off from the rest on the west, and rolled itself four furlongs, that is literally 800 meters, and stood still at the east mountain, 
till the roads were spoiled by the obstruction. Now obviously this earthquake was strong enough to alter the topography of the city of Jerusalem. Some scholars believe that this earthquake was of such a magnitude it affected not only Jerusalem but also the surrounding region. Now, in the first two chapters of Amos, the prophet is going to record fire and brimstone type of judgments on Israel's neighboring nations. It is possible that it was this awesome and great earthquake with lightning storms and with the prairie fires that it would have caused. This is what might have fulfilled the judgments that are spoken of in the first two chapters. You see, science and history and archaeology all combined to date the earthquake of Amos as 756 BC. This makes the time of Amos' prophecy two years earlier, or 558 BC. Now, Amos also tells us he was a herdsman from Tekoa. Tekoa was a hick town. It was a one traffic light kind of town. This was the kind of place where dogs live under the front porch, where mailboxes are made out of old car parts, where funeral homes have neon signs, where there is a tire swinging in everyone's front yard, where children are named after good hunting dogs, and where everyone in town knows how to milk a goat. This is where Amos was from. He was from Tekoa. Now, Tekoa was a country village 19.2 kilometers southeast of Jerusalem in the Judean wilderness. It was actually the last settlement between Jerusalem and the Dead Sea. In chapter 7, verse 14 to 15, later in the book, he tells us, I was no prophet, nor was I a son of a prophet. I guess you can say that Amos was the first non-profit organization. He goes on to say in chapter 7, But I was a sheep breeder and a tender of sycamore fruit. Then the Lord took me as I followed the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go prophesy to my people Israel. Now in chapter 1, the Hebrew term sheep breeders refers to sheep, but in chapter 7, the same English word sheep breeder is actually a different Hebrew word. It is a more generic word. It can also refer to cattle. Thus, we can conclude that Amos must have been a rancher who raised cows and sheep. He was a shepherd and a cowboy, and thus he was also a farmer. Here we are told he raised sycamore figs. Apparently, Amos was quite a country boy. He knew animals and he knew agriculture. And... He built a business, and it was his business, no doubt, that took him north to Israel. He often visited the cultural and the religious centers there, and there he saw the sins of the northern kingdom of Israel, the immorality, the injustices, and the idolatry. So, one day God called Amos to leave behind his business and to go prophesy to the northern kingdom of Israel. Now remember, chapter 7 says that Amos was not a professional prophet. He had no degrees, he had no formal training, he had never been ordained by men. He was just a good old boy of a southern town who God called north to the urban cities to deliver a series of warnings.
You could say that Amos was an amateur. And I am sure he did not mind you calling him that. Do you know what the word amateur means? Well, it is actually a French word which means for the love of it. Hey, Amos was not a professional minister. It was not a profession for him, serving the Lord, prophesying and speaking for God. No, it was his passion. It was a calling and it was not a career. The prophet Amos was in the ministry because of the love for the Lord and he was willing to preach God's word. May God give us more men and women like Amos. Not men and women who choose the ministry, but men and women that God has chosen. You see, too many pastors are pastors because they saw the ministry as a profitable career option or an attractive position, a big salary perhaps, or plenty of time to play golf. They have no deep love for God. They have no passion for His people. Today's church has paid professionals. What we need are amateurs like Amos. Amos 1 verse 2 a says, The Lord roars from Zion and utters His voice from Jerusalem. You see, the prophet's voice is not the still small whisper of the Holy Spirit. It is a godly growl. It is an attention-grabbing voice, like a lion's roar. And here we are told from where the Lord roars. And this is why Amos' prophecy was so controversial in his day. You see, right from the start, the prophet picks a fight with the establishment of the northern kingdom. For he says, the Lord roars from Zion. In other words, God speaks from the hills of Jerusalem. His ancient dwelling place was his pulpit. Jerusalem was the podium from where God spoke. And this angered the leaders of Israel, for they had broken away from Jerusalem and from the southern kingdom of Judah. You see, the northern kingdom had invented an alternate system of governance and worship that God despised. You remember the history. After Solomon, the kingdom split in two, north and south. Judah remained loyal to the Davidic dynasty and to the temple, but the ten northern tribes set up rival altars in Dan and in Bethel, and they established an alternate capital in Samaria. Here God, through his prophet Amos, trumpets his disapproval. The Lord roars, not from Samaria, but from Jerusalem. He also says in verse 2b, The pastures of the shepherds mourn, and the top of Carmel withers. The mountains of Carmel were the heartland of the northern kingdom. The fact their shepherds mourn means judgment is coming. If I invited my wife, Joyce, to go with me to a rugby game, it would not really prove much because I like rugby. But if I said, honey, I just purchased some tickets for a live show, oh boy, that is true love. For me, a night at the Pretoria Theatre would be a torture. So if I bought tickets to see something at the theatre, then she would know I really love her. Real love is loving someone in the way they want to be loved, not just in a way that is convenient for you to love. Do you get that? And yet, this is the way Israel treated God. Their alternative religion was one of convenience, and that is why God called it idolatry. 
And God will judge Israel. But before Amos speaks of that judgment, he unloads on the surrounding cities and nations for how they had treated God's people, the Hebrews. He starts with Damascus and Syria. In Amos 1 verse 3, he says, Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Damascus, and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because they have threshed Gilead with threshing instruments of iron. Now here Amos uses a phrase that will reoccur over and over in his prophecy. For three transgressions and for four, I will not turn away the punishment. When I was six years old, I played baseball and you have probably heard the baseball slogan that says, three strikes and you are out. Well, in essence, people, here yeah, the Lord is giving Damascus four strikes. He is showing them mercy. God's judgments are always served with mercy. But after the fourth strike, the prophet Amos is like the umpire. You are out of here. So Amos proves God's precision when he pinpoints Damascus' crime. He says, they have threshed Gilead with threshing implements of iron. This was the region east of the Jordan River, what is today the Golan Heights. At that time, it was poorly fortified, and so the Syrians were able to prey on the defenseless Hebrews who lived there. And so Amos compares their abuse to that of threshing. The Hebrew word means trampled. Plows in those days were made out of wood boards that were studded with metal spikes. Thus, they were dragged across the ground and the field. This was the type of treatment that Syria had afflicted upon Gilead. There is a line from James Friswell that sums up God's judgment. Though the mills of God grind slowly, yet they grind exceeding small. Though with patience he stands waiting, with exactness grinds he all. In verse 4 to 5, we are told what the judgment is. But I will send a fire into the house of Haziel, which shall devour the palaces of Ben-Hadad. I will break also the bar of Damascus and will cut off the inhabitant from the plain of Aven, and him that holdeth the scepter from the house of Eden. And the people of Syria shall go into captivity unto Ker, Say of the Lord. Now listen, people. Benadad was the king of Syria. He and his capital city of Damascus are going to receive the same treatment that they have shown. In fact, later, Tiglaf Peleser the third, that is a very strange name, just know that he was a future Assyrian king. Later we find that he wrote in his annals these words, I destroyed 592 towns of the 16 precincts of the country of Damascus, rendering them like hills over which the flood passed. In other words, Syria had destroyed Gilead, but in return God was going to raise up the Assyrians to come and trample Damascus, which is exactly what happened. Benedet and Syria got what was coming to it from the hands of the Assyrian invasion. I cannot help but to think when I read the story of a modern day parallel, before the Six-Day War in 1967, the Israelis had a spy in Damascus, and his name was Eli Cohen. 
In fact, there is a book about his life. It is a fascinating book. It is called Our Man in Damascus. Eli was eventually caught by the Syrians and he was hung. But before the war, Eli visited these bunkers with a Syrian general. The bunkers that the Syrians had in the Golan Heights. Eli made the suggestion that the Syrians plant eucalyptus trees around the bunkers to provide shade for their soldiers because it gets very, very hot up in the sunshine. The Syrians bought into the idea, but when the Six-Day War broke out and the Israeli jets went to bomb the Syrians' installations in the Golan Heights, guess what they used as their targets? Yes, they dropped their bombs on the eucalyptus groves and knocked out the Syrians' fortifications. Once again, a fire fell on Syria. Verse 6 targets another ancient enemy who remains hostile to Israel, even into modern times. Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Gaza and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because they carried away captive the whole captivity to deliver them up to Edom. Now Gaza, as I previously said, was the capital of the Philistines and is also today a Palestinian stronghold. Their crime was to capture Hebrew cities and then sell their citizens as slaves to Edom, which sounds just like a tactic out of the ISIS playbook today. That kind of cruelty, of human slavery, has a long history in the Middle East. But God will judge Gaza. For in Amos 1 verse 7 and 8, we are told, But I will send a fire on the wall of Gaza, which shall devour the palaces thereof. And I will cut off the inhabitant from Ashdod, and him that holdeth the scepter from Ashkelon. And I will turn my hand against Ekron, and the remnant of the Philistines shall perish, saith the Lord God. Now Amos mentions four of the five Philistine cities that are located on Israel's southwest coast. He mentions Gaza, and he mentions Asdod, and he mentions Ascalon and Ekron. And here is this Bible study quiz. Are you ready for it? Can anyone name the fifth Philistine city not mentioned here? How about Goliath's hometown, the city of Gath? Verse 9 sets its sights on Tyre. Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Tyrus, and for four I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because they delivered up the whole captivity to Edom, and remembered not the brotherly agreement. Verse 10 says, But I will send a fire on the wall of Tyrus, which shall devour the palaces thereof. Now Tyre was the capital of the Phoenicians, and they were guilty of the same crimes as the Philistines. Here they received the same judgment. Seems like God's punishment always fits the crime. Tyre sold Hebrews into slavery, and history tells us when Alexander the Great invaded Tyre 400 years later, Guess what he does? He sells 30,000 of their inhabitants into slavery. You see, precious people, what goes around comes around. In Amos 1 verse 11 to 12, we read, Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Edom, and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because he did pursue his brother with the sword.
And that cost of all pity, and his anger did not tear perpetually, and he kept his wrath forever. But I will send a fire upon Timan, which shall devour the palaces of Bozra. Edom and Israel were the descendants of Esau and Jacob. And as you know, they were brothers, but their hostility was everlasting. In fact, when Moses led the nation through the wilderness to the promised land, it was the Edomites who refused to let Israel pass through their territory. And it was really from that point onward that the relationship between these two nations never ever improved. The Edomites harbored a grudge. They were never willing to put the hatchet behind them. Instead, they used a hatchet on their brother. They were merciless. They were driven by bitterness. And as a result, God judged them. It reminds me of a comedy that I saw many, many years ago, which featured two brothers, who we would call Dumb and Dumber. Old Dumber, he complained about an acquaintance of his who always slapped him on the chest. His brother asked him, what are you going to do to stop him? He said, well, I am going to put a stick of dynamite in my shirt pocket so that the next time he slaps me in my chest, he is going to blow off his hand. Now, obviously, what Dummer did not take into account was that he was also going to blow a hole in his chest. That is right. And is this not how bitterness works? You think you are harming the other guy, but what you are really doing is killing yourself, blowing a hole in your chest. It is true, anger is an asset that can do more harm to the vessel in which it is stored than to anything on which it is poured. When are we going to learn the lesson to harbor and nurse a grudge and the person you are hurting the most is yourself? Now Amos 1 verse 13 says, Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of the children of Ammon, and for four I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because they have ripped up the women with child of Gilead, that they might enlarge their border. These barbaric Ammonites ripped open the wombs of pregnant women to spread their terror. And let me say it, the Ammonite sword and the abortionist scalpel have a lot in common. We are told that Ammon used this tactic to enlarge its territory. And do you know that is what the abortion industry in South Africa is also doing? Abortion now is big business in this country. Greed, not the right to choose, is what drives its wealth. A 15-year-old girl once had an abortion. She was coerced and told lies. The clinic literally talked her into aborting her baby. That is not pro-choice, people. That is pro-cash. In verse 14 to 15, we read about Amos' prophecies. But I will kindle a fire in the wall of Rabbah, and it shall devour the palaces thereof, with shouting in the day of battle, with a tempest in the day of the world wind. And their king shall go into captivity, and her princess together, saith the Lord. Rabbah, which is the capital of Ammon, will be crushed by the Assyrians. The judgment of the nations continues into chapter 2. Now Amos 2 verse 1 says, 
Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Moab, and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because he burnt the bones of the king of Edom into lime. The Moabites were guilty of profaning and violating the dead. They apparently exhumed the body of the king of Edom and had him cremated or they had his bones burned. This was actually an act of racial prejudice. The Moabites were showing their hatred for the Edomites. And as a result, God promises to judge the country of Moab. In Amos 2 verse 2 to 3, he says, but I will send a fire upon Moab, and it shall devour the palaces of Kerioth. This was the religious center of Chemosh, the idol of the Moabites. Moab shall die with a loud noise, with shouting and trumpet sound. And I will break off the judge from its midst, and slay all its princes with him, saith the Lord. Moab will also be punished. What are the lessons that we can learn from this Bible study? The book of Amos opens with an informative who, where, when, and a frightening why. It is the why of God's roar that lingers. In fact, if we will listen, the same roar is sounded today. It is the roar of a holy God in righteous judgment on His people. His wrath and grace must never be separated. Both must be kept in perfect balance. It is out of grace that God judges His people, and it is only after we have heard the roar of His judgment and repented that fresh grace can be received. What makes God's roar in judgment of Christians and the church today? Or more personally, in your life and mine. If we were to make a list, we would find some of the same things that made him roar over Israel. That is what makes Amos so relevant for today. And alarming. And yet, if we will be a doer of God's word and be honest and open to him, we will experience the grip of the Lord's holiness on us and will be able to change what needs to be changed. Listen, only the faithful will make it through the last days. But thank God, He is not willing that any should perish, according to 2 Peter 3 verse 9. However, God cannot stand by and witness multiplied injustices taking place to the loss, the harm, and the hurt of his work. He will not just stand by and watch that happen. When people consider what is going on in the remnant church, there is a tendency to feel that God does not care or that he has abandoned his people. But all that is needed is to read the accounting process which we see revealed in Amos chapter 1 and chapter 2. And we begin to see that God is still very much interested and still very, very active. Sometimes it takes a long time for a cup to become full. None of us know how fast our cup is filling or when it is going to fill. It falls uniquely for each individually. But when the cup is full, mark it down. The Lord is going to roar out of Jerusalem. The greatest lesson we find portrayed in the first two chapters of Amos is that in these last days, it is only going to be the faithful who are going to make it through. We can be among the faithful. We can allow our cups to be filled with the Holy Spirit. God cares and He is working. His will is going to be done in all areas.
He is preparing a people who are going to go through the trials of the last days without spot, without wrinkle or without any such thing. In all areas of scripture, the lesson is basically the same. Turn from your sins and be saved, all ye people of the Lord. See 2 Chronicles 7 verse 14. This is what our Heavenly Father wants more than anything else. And this is how He wants us to be found. Pure and clean and ready to meet Jesus when He comes. Come Lord Jesus, come we pray. Hallelujah. I want to conclude Amos part 1 with this thought. Jesus died on the cross of Calvary to set you free and to give you hope for your future. He will forgive your sins, hand them over to Him. Now is the time to make a decision to follow and to believe in Jesus. If you have any questions or would like someone to pray with you, we would be happy to speak with you. Please give us a call at 0828282085. We are so excited for your new life in Christ. I will continue this Bible study teaching on the book of Amos next time. So be sure to join us again.